Hi, everyone. I'm Alice Brown, and today I'm joined by Gil Penalosa of 880 Cities for a special episode of Waterfront Wednesdays brought to you by Boston Harbor Now. Gil, thank you for joining us today. Um, you came to Boston last November in 2019, and you gave a really exciting and inspiring talk that was so cool that I was like, I can't just look at cities in America and learn from them. I need to go to Colombia. And I went and did Ciclovia in Bogota. And I went to Cartagena and saw the streets there. I saw the gondolas in Medellin. You've totally been an inspiration. But since you've left your role in Colombia, you have become the founder of 8 to 80 Cities. You advocate for more inclusive cities that include people as young as 8 and as old as 80. What are some examples of cities designs that are working for older adults and kids? And what are some examples of designs that don't work for everybody? Well, thank you very much. I, I think that first is not a 280, but it's eight and 80. Because some people say, oh, but I got little children or my grandmother is 85. No, 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 no. Eight and 80 is the indicator species. It's kind of like the canary in the mine. Uh, so if the city is good for the eight and the city is good for the 80, it's going to be good for everybody from zero to over a hundred. And this is very important because like the people in Boston that are being born today, half of them are going to live over a hundred years. I think we have done many accomplishments in, in, in the lifetime of humanity, including like putting a person on the moon. Uh, but one of the main accomplishments is living longer. We've been around for 200,000 years. In 200,000 years, up until 200 years ago, no country had a life expectancy above 45, none. And today there is no country with a life expectancy below 45. It's amazing what happened in such a short time. And when you ask about the cities, I think what is interesting is that whatever works for the eight also works for the 80. Uh, but doesn't work for the 30. So we need to stop building cities as if everybody was 30 year old and athletic. Like when we're going to do an intersection, the 30 year old athletic walks at one pace, the eight year old or the 80 at a different pace. And even the babies on a stroller less or people with walkers or with wheelchairs or whatever. So the idea is how to make it work uh, for everybody. And th th this, th this should be, the, the, the sidewalk and the crosswalk and the library and the school and the restaurants and the buildings and the neighborhoods and public transit and everything that we do in the cities. Yeah. At Boston Harbor Now, we think a lot about accessing the waterfront and make sure that waterfronts are welcoming to everyone. What are some things you've seen as examples of ways that people have designed, whether it's a riverfront or a harbor front that says we're really focused on, you know, not just the 30 year olds. What are some great designs you would recommend? Well, first, the waterfronts are magical, are fantastic all over the world. Unfortunately, in many places, people have privatized the waterfronts. I think something that there should be national laws everywhere, almost mandated by the United Nations, that all waterfronts by the river, by the lakes, by the ocean should be public. Uh, because it's very clear that we need to have contact with nature. That is that that makes con having contact with nature is good for physical health, but also for mental health. Uh, so the the waterfronts play a very very important uh, role in 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 our quality of life. It's good for climate change. It's good for mental health, for physical health of every. And fortunately, many cities are working a lot on the waterfronts, like on, on many of the river waterfronts. A hundred years ago and before, all of the factories were set up next to the rivers so that they would throw all the garbage into a river. Uh, even places like New York, you, you, you did uh, Fifth Avenue is and Central Park right in the heart of Manhattan so that it would be as far away from the two rivers as possible. Uh, but in the last 50 years or so, people have realized how magical waterfronts are and they are redeveloping the waterfronts and taking all of the factories out of the rivers. Pittsburgh has done a lot of good things. What you are doing in Boston is also amazing and people love it. The four seasons, it's not just a summer thing, but it's throughout the year. And, and many cities like Oslo, 
uh, Toronto is doing a lot of things on the water from there. Lots of things is working on the front water from because they're really magical, but for everybody, it, it's, it's kind of a, a great equalizer. It's people of all ages and all ethnicities, but also all incomes and backgrounds. It's interesting that you talk about, um, you know, the evolution of waterfronts. What does it take for people who are 80, say, or even older, who have these memories of these unwelcoming waterfronts? What have you seen cities do to bring people back to say, like, it's changed? Come check it out. Well, I, I think that one of the things that we need also is every time that we do redevelopments, we should have like, like, like a visual uh, history of photos of the before and after, because sometimes people forget and people move a lot from city to city and then and they all of a sudden they think that it, it was always like that and they don't realize how it was. So even just as simple as having photos throughout the, 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 the boardwalk on the waterfront, the before and the after, also because people become very proud and then people that live in the city, they, they, they kind of own it and then they have family members or friends from other cities or other countries that they visit and they take them to the waterfront and they say, oh, this is how we were. And I think also doing events is good to bring people. I think that we need to work on events, but even more important, I think we need to work in programs uh, because the events is like the 4th of July once a, is once a year. Instead, the programs is weekly or monthly or daily. And then it, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a lot better when, when we try to have people that are uh, more physically active. So it's better to have walking groups that are daily or maybe three times a week. So, so but, but through those, it's, it's important to bring people into the waterfront. In terms of thinking, you already mentioned that 8 to 80 is sort of an indicator species. It's really zero to 100. And that could be for ages, but that could also be for temperatures, right? <laughs> you want a city that works at zero degrees and 100 degrees. Um, and you've been working a lot this year to think about how people can spend more time outdoors during COVID. What are some recommendations you've been making to people about all weather cities? Well, one is that in order to have a great winter, a winter city or winter waterfront, we need to have a great summer city and summer waterfront. It's not all of a sudden that you can go to Houston where the downtown is absolutely horrible, uh, totally car oriented and not people. And then you say, okay, doesn't matter. The city is horrible in the summer, but we're gonna make it fantastic in the winter. No, if, if the city is not really good, so, so we gotta work on things. And usually the things that work in one season also work in the others. But in addition, of course, when we have extreme weather, we need to put a little bit more emphasis on the extreme weather, whether it's uh, the summers in Arizona or it's the winters in Boston. We got to put a little bit more effort. Actually, I, I, su I suggest to cities like Boston, don't put too much effort in the summer because everybody's putting effort in the summer. The private sector, the NGOs uh, and the citizens themselves, they, they need almost very few incentives. But when the winter comes, then we gotta do better events. So if we are gonna do uh, movies in the parks or movies in the water from in the winter, uh, we gotta put really good sound and nice cream uh, and let's have hot chocolate and beaver tails and let, let's make it, a, we gotta make it a little bit more fun and more exciting. Uh, one of the things that we need urgently is to change the mindsets of people. It, it, it's incredible, uh, you know, people in winter cities like Boston, the, the media people, the weather people, from in September, they start saying, oh my God, winter is coming. If you can go to Arizona or Florida, go, lucky people that can go. And when there's gonna be a storm, maybe because they wanna have high ratings or something, and they want people to watch the news, they start four days in a, a storm is coming, a, a gigantic, give me everybody once in a life. And then the third day, and then they say, and then it, it, it ends up being two inches of snow. Uh, but, but they have kept people for a full week negative about it. Instead, okay, you get snow, say, oh, tomorrow we're gonna get snow, it's beautiful. It's like if God painted everything white, get ready your sleds, get ready your winter boots, get, get ready to go out and enjoy and the beauty and take photographs. So, so we need to change that attitude. Of course, it also helps if we develop activities. For example, cities like Boston has magnificent parks and trails, but you need to plow all those trails of snow. You need to really clean them so that people can walk or run or bike uh, in the middle of the winter. 
uh, the city with the best park system in North America, Minneapolis, they get a lot more snow than Boston, twice or three times more snow. And the, a, a few years ago, they said, oh, but no one is walking. Why should we plow the trails? They said, well, let's do a two year pilot. And they saw so many people, they became so full that now every single trail in Minneapolis is plowed during the winter because that pe people want to go. So, so we need to put a little bit more emphasis, plow those. Also issues such as lights. Many times people in the winter are more affected by because it's dark rather than because it's cold. If you are cold, you put on a good jacket, good boots and good gloves and you're okay. But people are affected because it's dark. So we should promote lots of lights. For example, I say that we should have promoting in the homes to have not, not Christmas lights, but have winter lights. So that is not just for two weeks, but we should have them from November to March and everywhere. The city could help by doing the public parks and doing some of the main streets. And then it will become something fun and exciting for people uh, to go out and visit. Uh, so we also need the programs, like I was saying, the, maybe the, the fireworks at some time or whatever, but we also need the programs, not only the events. So we need to have Tai Chi in the park and we need to have walking groups. And by the way, when I'm I talk so much about walking because it's the number one activity in the parks any time of the year. At the end of the day, it's about sociability. It, it, it's about being with others. So, so some of these things, putting up colors, uh, is also something that, that, that people enjoy. Uh, so uh, allowing food trucks and uh, food places. So many times you go in the winter to the parks and the washrooms are closed. Uh, and they say closed for the season. What do you mean? Parks are not a summer uh, infrastructure. Parks are 52 weeks of the year. So in the parks, we should have the concessions, the, the coffee and the hot chocolate throughout the year. We should have the washrooms open throughout the year. So these are some of the things that city officials need to change their mindset up and, 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 and work in the winter. Yeah, I think some of that's been exacerbated by COVID because for so long we've given the private sector, oh, you can provide the public restroom at the coffee shop or at the restaurant or wherever, and all of those have closed as well. So that's that's exactly. been changing cities. And also when you go to the private ones, in many cases you're also discriminating because you go to the private ones and they don't want older people if they don't have money. They don't want to have young people with skateboard with skateboards. Uh, they don't want, many times they don't want to have black people or Hispanics or racialized. So it, it becomes very complicated. Uh, so if you are white and young and wealthy, then the, you are welcome to to the, to the washrooms at Starbucks. If you are not, you are uh, then you are not welcome. So and and also uh, in many places you need to buy. So it doesn't make any sense that you need to buy a coffee to use the washroom. And because you drink the coffee, then you're going to have to go to the washroom again. Uh, so it, it becomes it, it's really an issue of equity uh, and, and and having our public places uh, for everybody. When you're having conversations with city leaders about how to make these decisions, right? I'm sure there are some city leaders who are like, well, people will be mad if I take their parking away, or people will be mad if I spend money on, you know, winter programming in a park. How do you tell that story of, you know, you have a limited budget, but creating these eight to 80 cities is is the best use of city funds? Well, I think that ideally you should, should focus on the benefits. It's not about walking, it's not about the park, it's about the benefit. And all of this is good for physical and mental health. All of this is good for economic development. It's good for mobility. It's good for climate change. It's good for, so I think something is like, you need like a five, six, seven cards on your pocket with different benefits. And you gotta see that this specific counselor, what matters to him or to her? And then you say, okay, it's a, uh, it's, it, it's climate change. Okay, so let's come up with the benefits, why parks are good for climate change. So focus on the benefits rather than, than the activity. Walking or cycling or parks or whatever is the means, it's not the end. The end is, is, is how are we gonna have citizens that are gonna live healthier and happier? How are we gonna have cities that are more equitable and sustainable? Gil, this has been incredibly insightful. As we wrap up, can you tell me one thing that you're really looking to forward to doing outside in cities this winter? You know, you live in cities, you love living in cities. What are some things you're looking forward to experiencing yourself? 
Well, I, I, I always, I love when, when I come to work, I always bike to work uh, at plus 30 in the summer, I mean plus 100 in the summer or at minus 10 in the winter. Uh, and I love it. I love it. When, when I'm on the bike and I feel the air on, on my face, I love it. I also enjoy running in the parks. Uh, also, any time of the season, and that's, that's really like the Scandinavians say that there's no such thing as bad weather, it's bad clothing. Uh, I run maybe four or five times a week, and and, and I love it. And also, when, because when you do it on the waterfronts, on the parks, uh, every day is different. It's uh, so one day you, you see some flowers that were not there the day before, uh, or you see a, a, a tree or a leaf or something is... Uh, or you see other people, you see a people and a dog or someone that wasn't there. So every day is, is so different, it's so kind. Uh, so that's some of the things that I, that, that I look very forward to. And from the point of view of cities, I hope that this COVID has allowed us to see that, that we could change. All of a sudden, in, 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 few, in days or weeks, we saw changes that people thought it was gonna take years to make. Like all of a sudden developing bicycle corridors with protected bike lanes. Uh, we saw all of the sudden cities taking away, cities like Oakland, California, they, they created uh, slow streets. For example, this is something that every city everywhere in the world should have. All of the neighborhood streets, all of them, should be only for the cars, for the people that live in the neighborhood. If you are going from point A to point B, you gotta use the arterials. If the arterial is, has a traffic jam, okay, you gotta wait. It's not that if the arterial is in a traffic jam, then you can cut through the neighborhood's full speed. So the slow streets, basically, they close the, the, the neighborhood streets for only local traffic. And the local traffic is at five miles per hour. So the local streets all of a sudden became playgrounds for children, for adults, for people on wheelchairs and so on. Less noise, uh, le much safer, uh, less pollution or whatever. So I hope that a lot of these things that, and this happened overnight, but we need also to realize that COVID has not changed anything. It has opened our eyes. It has allowed us to see that change is possible. But if we don't act on it, we are going to go back to how we were before. And, and the reality is that how we were doing cities before was not sustainable environmentally, financially. It was not good for physical health, for mental health. So it was kind of like a wake up. And I hope that in the post-COVID, everything we do in cities will be around health and sustainability and equitable. Gil, thank you so much. I completely agree. We're all in this together and we can we can come back with more sustainable and equitable cities at the end of this. It's okay. been a real inspiration. Thank you very much. You can follow Gil on Twitter at Penalosa underscore G and his organization at 880 Cities. And you can follow me at Fairy Fairy. I hope to see you on the waterfront on sunny days and snowy ones.